Yeah, thank you so much for inviting me. This is a long story. I was approached, I think, six months ago or eight months ago that this lecture series was planned. And I was approached by Dr. Friedrich Dahlhaus, who is the director of the Goethe Institute in Bratislava. And the backstory is that we met in 2005 in Jerusalem. And our positions were almost the same. So I was giving a master class at Bezalel University in Jerusalem, and he was working at the Goethe Institute, and he was supporting the master class and my lecture. So we are in the same positions, but he's not here. <laughs> so um, yeah, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I'm very happy about this event. I saw the list of people you invited from Germany, and I think it's a very interesting mix of people. It's about generations, about theory and practice in architecture. And you will see that Sandra Bartoli, who is a close friend of mine, who is um, expected to be here next time, she is talking about um, her approach to ecology and landscape and urbanism, and it will be very interesting and even widen the field. Um, I would like maybe to introduce myself a bit. So my name is Verena van Beckerath. Um, I'm a partner at Heide und van Beckerath. We founded our office in 1996 together with a third partner who, is, who left the office in 2012. His name is Andrew Alberts, and he did most of the photographs you will see because he became an architectural photographer. And we work very closely and have a very close relationship. And we sometimes think that what you can see of our work has been seen through his eyes. So it's also about maybe kind of media aspect of architecture that we can discuss later. Um, it's not true that I'm a soci sociologist and psychologist because I left sociology and psychology after 50% of studies, I think, because I had the feeling that I wanted to produce something. I was not really satisfied with theory, I think, though when I then started to study architecture, I somehow left all my interests behind, like literature, history of art, and also um, certain approaches to society, but because the, the studies in architecture were so intensive that in a way I was not able to keep my interests, which were there, but they were somehow hidden a little bit. Um, but then later when I worked with Adolf Krishanitz, who is an architect from Vienna, you might know his work. He's very interesting and I really recommend you to study his, uh, his work. He was a professor at uh, UDK in Berlin and after graduation, two years after graduation, I became his assistant when he was just starting his professorship. It was a really important time for me. It was like studying again, like studying for a second time. I found it in a way that it was a privilege to be in this position between learning and teaching and researching, but not being 100% responsible, but being also a student in a way. And I think in a way I kept this, uh, I kept this through my professional life and I started my uh, position at Bauhaus Universität Weimar in 2016 and there I'm trying to transform a bit the way of teaching. I try to, I, I de I'm developing a kind of collective approach to teaching and learning and I'm always telling the students, I want to learn myself, so please don't think that I know everything and you don't nothing, but we are different generations, we have different 
ways of looking at things and that's why I told you I like traveling with the students because um, this besides other <laughs> things allows for um, the production of new knowledge and this is what I'm really interested in. So maybe my previous studies in psychology and sociology are still part of my approach to architecture and society. Yeah. Um, in our office, we, for quite a long time, we have been teaching assistants or um, research associates at various uh, universities like TU Berlin and UDK, I think until around 2000 maybe. And then we had a phase where we um, worked on larger, so we had one commission that came every other year. Um, it was a large commission for a fair stand a really large fair stand, 2,000 square meters. We, um, we used to say that it's an urban scale, even though it was an interior project. And it was really interesting, but on the other hand, we missed, of course, that after 14 days, everything is gone. So it's a very uh, short term. You work for one year, and then there's a kind of exhibition for two weeks. So. We lost a little bit. We, we worked on architectural projects, but only one at a time. And then in 2008, when Tim and I somehow reinvented the office, the two of us, um, we started to develop a housing project, a collective housing project, where we invited family and friends to collaborate with us. And this goes back to um, a kind of, you could say, tradition, but it's not at the beginning of the 2000s that younger architects in Berlin would find an empty plot and then try to develop a housing project with some, a few apartments maybe. And then it developed a little bit further that the discussion of work and live and how to combine studio space and um, apartment space and so on. You will see I'm, I have chosen one project to present, but it's a large project and it has a lot of um, aspects to reflect on. Um, and this project has, or in a way, goes back to this idea if architects would be able to be part of the developing process, not be servants or serving as architects for a client who already knows what to do, how to sell, how to make money, but to be more part of the conceptual part of what we do, not only how we do it, but what we do and why we do it and how we want to think about ourselves as architects, what our role in society is, and so on. So that's what we started in 2008, and we started with the first project, then we collaborated with an, a partner office, we did a second project, this second project, the first one was published quite a lot, the second one was published all over the world, there's still a lot of PhD students approaching our office because uh, they want to work on collective living and so on. And then we started a third project, which is the one I want to present tonight. And we are <coughs> actually, again, my office alone, we are working on a fourth project, which is not in Berlin, but in Fürth. It's a town near Nuremberg. And, but at the same time, we are doing other things. For example, we have um, realized a lab building in Berlin. We have built a transformer station. Uh, we are working on a museum in Thessaloniki together with um, an office from Tel Aviv. So we are doing other things, but I think in a way um, what is maybe interesting for you is 
this idea of being part of the, the conceptualization of a project like a housing project that could also be something else maybe. And that's what I want to present to you tonight. Um, there was a little misunderstanding with the title because I was asking for the title of the series and I was told reflections of architecture and I was a little bit ashamed, but then I wrote back, shouldn't it be reflections on architecture? But then the title of the series is Reflections of Architecture, and that's because you are the ones who are going to reflect these lectures. So I called my lecture Reflections on Architecture and Housing because I myself am reflecting my own work, and this is what I want to share with you. Um, yeah, and the project I am presenting is quite large. It's, it has almost 90 units, so it's a kind of machine. It's a huge project in the center of Berlin. Um, the interesting thing, or one of the interesting things from my opinion is that it allows for many different scales and maybe the smaller scale is this scale where you think that this could be a very simple bungalow style <laughs> housing. Uh, but then if you look in this direction, you can see hmm, something is wrong. Maybe it's different. Maybe we are not in the periphery of the city. and. In fact, this is the rooftop or one of the roof levels of the building and it has four studio units on the roof. And what you can also see here is, and this is a bigger theme of our work that public and private space are somehow merging because this garden could be the private garden of the studio building to the right or it could be a communal space for circulation, but who is going to water the flowers? That's the question, and this is something we gave to the inhabitants of the building. And of course it's both, because it is a circulation space, but it also serves as a kind of foregarden to the studio. And the larger picture is this one. You see, you might recognize a few buildings, you know, from Berlin. To the right, you see a Baroque palais. This is part of the Baroque um, city extension in the 18th century. And I will come back to it. And then you can see Okay, I should use this. You can see this is the Internationale Bauausstellung from the 1980s. I will come back to this as well. Cranes, a lot of cranes. The TV tower, this is the Springer Publishing House. This was built next to the wall because behind the wall was East Berlin. And the publishing house used to um, communicate news to East Berlin from here. Um, these houses are very interesting. They were built at the same time. These are um, four housing projects at Leipziger Straße in the former Eastern Park. They, they were really opposite of each other, the two. And Behind the Springer building, you see the OMA construction site because they are currently realizing a large project for the Springer Publishing House for their media uh, department. Uh, wait, let me see what I want to show you. Also, okay, this is our building. This building is also part of the development. I will talk about and this as well. This is a school and this is a football 
um, place where you can see football. And this is Lindenstraße and Friedrichstraße would be somewhere here. Mm, this is the Baroque extension and what is interesting is that at that time maps were had the, the south here and the north here, so you have to think it the other way around. Um, this is the Landwehrkanal. This was a beautiful, formal, round square. These were the axes that came from the mid medieval um, city core, and we are somewhere here. And the building I was showing you is this one because what is really interesting that this plan not only was a kind of two-dimensional plan for the city, but it was also uh, bringing architecture into the, the idea of the plan. So it was three-dimensional in a way, and the idea was that at certain um, special locations, uh, the plan would manifest itself in the third dimension with an architectural project. Um, this is a photograph, might be taken from Google Earth, I don't remember, but this is from, so you can see the Daniel Liebeskind Jewish Museum. This has become the Jewish Museum in Berlin. This is the extension. This was finished in 2001, maybe, I don't really remember, but maybe the beginning of the 2000s. And here you can see the former flower market hall, and this was the circulation space around the hall. So this was in a, kind, a kind of infrastructural project in a part of the city that had become or that had um, transformed from periphery to center because in West Berlin this was periphery and it had become a very central location. So the flower market was taken out around 2005. The hall was kept, it's from the 1960s. And the idea was to develop this area. This is Friedrichstraße. Yeah. Okay. Um, this is how it looked like when we started to think about the project, so it was still circulation space. You can see the hall. And we are now one block uh, away from this part of Berlin in, um, in another city extension, urban extension. Uh, from the 1950s and early 60s. And this is a part from Berlin Kreuzberg which was, which was destructed. First it was bombed and then many houses that were ruins are still standing but a large part of this district was taken away. And this is a very interesting plan because it's a kind of pl plan libre. It doesn't respect streets. It's only, it's oriented north and south. Um, there are, I think, very small apartments to each staircase. But the beautiful thing is that it is embedded in a large garden, kind of park. <coughs> so it was, when I came to Berlin in the middle of the 1980s, it was called the Green Kreuzberg, the green part of Kreuzberg, because there were so many trees and gardens. And this is also because of this idea, this modernist idea of rebuilding the city in a totally different way. Mm. And when you walk through this area, you see a newer building. This is ours, another one. So this is an excursion. Um, this is another building we have been planning and realizing between 2010 and 13. Um, and when you come a little bit closer, you can see that 
it has some interesting details. And in this photograph, by Andrew Alberts, of course, you can see most of the details or architectural approaches that were relevant for us. You can see six stories of individual living. You can see that the building is lifted a little bit so that those who live on the uh, ground floor are a little bit lifted from the public because it's, a, it's not a very big street, but anyway, cars are coming and so on. Uh, you can also see that there's no fence, which, which is interesting. We have put this building into the, the Plan Libre, but you will see how. And you can see a ramp that leads to the souterrain where you will find the entrance. So this is lifted, but there is a double, spa double height communal space here, which has four doors and it is managed and maintained by the community, but it can also be used by neighborhood neighbor for neighborhood activities and sometimes they have concerts. So it's a kind of semi-public, semi-private space. Yeah, and then you can see that the facade seems to change a little bit, so you don't really know why. But at the same time, there are balconies that are wrapping the whole building. And um, the facade is a wooden facade. It's based on a modular approach, which you cannot really see, but the idea was to allow for individual floor plans. And to realize individual floor plans, we had to be flexible with the uh, placement of the windows. So we developed a modular approach, which is based on 60 centimeters. And the 60 centimeters can be a framed window that you cannot open or a window that you can open, or a series of windows that you can open so that you have a large opening from the apartment to the balcony, or it can also be a closed element. Um, this is part of the group. So this is the second Baugruppe that we realized. We collaborated with Eva and Jesko <coughs> Fetzer, who are, Ifa is in other office, and Jesko Feza is sometimes collaborating with them. So it's us on one hand and Ifa and Jesko Feza on the other hand. Um, we collaborated because we were already working on the first Baugruppen project, and they <coughs> approached us because they wanted to found a project like this. They had the idea to have a building where they could live with their own families, but also to invite friends, a little bit what we did two years before. And um, many of, many participants of the group are artists or are working in the creative industries, you could say. So they were very much aware of, on one hand, the rising rent, that could be a problem for the young families they had. On the other hand, the fact that they wouldn't have um, much security when they are older. So they decided that investing in a project like this where they could also live would maybe, and they could also um, be part of the project and discuss the project with the architect and decide themselves for individual and collective decisions to be made. So it was a very interesting group because they had this awareness and they were very much um, prepared for an experiment like this. So um, the city of Berlin um, offered at that time, 2010, five plots to Baugruppen for a fixed price, which was interesting because it was no bidding. It was a kind of concept-based bidding, but it was no bidding for the price of the plot. It was a bidding based on the best concept. 
So a kind of competition, but more in the face of the development rather than in the face of finding a good architect to realize the project <coughs> that is already developed. So we have chosen one of the five plots which we found interesting, this one, and we won the plot <laughs> uh, in the end. And the idea was to have a very cheap building, affordable. Affordability was very mm, important. And we really wanted to find out how we could offer an affordable building that where the, maybe the qualities, the architectural qualities shift from good material or mm, I don't know how to say, from what we might think quality is to a kind of quality that is more part of a spatial quality, not material, not surface, but flexibility, um, and so on. So in the beginning, we made, we did tours to different projects in Berlin, so this was one of the tours, just to uh, give you an idea what kind of group they are. So here are the floor plans of the building. The building has a very simple and robust layout, as you can see. And here you can see the souterrain, which is storage, workshop, laundry. This is the, the, uh, the ground floor of the double height uh, collective space. This is the ramp I was talking about. The photograph was taken from here, from the garden. And this is the entrance. And then you can see six levels plus one, uh, six full levels, and one w where there are two more apartments, and here is a shared terrace, so it's six and a half. And what you can, we don't have to discuss this in depth, but what you can see on first sight is that every floor plan is different. And how can this be? Um, the uh, the construction is based on a concrete skeleton, which you might know rather from an industrial building than from a housing project where usually everything is the same, so you have your walls and so on and so on. So it's a skeleton. Then there is this wooden facade. And in order to be able to paint the facade, because wood has to be maintained, uh, and also for other reasons, um, we offered this all around balcony, which is very interesting because it's only one meter, but look at this apartment. This is one apartment. This is north, this is east, this is west. They have sunlight in the morning, sunlight in the evening, and they have a balcony with the length of 23 meters. Everything is really simple, but they have 23 meters balcony. Um, and you can also see that here, for example, the residents had the idea to sleep in a room like this. And what you can also see is that there is one element that you can find almost everywhere. Very often we provided doors along the facade so that the rooms can be connected, that they have a second connection. So there is a first connection and second connection. So this allows for rotations within the apartments and of course for more flexibility. For example, most of the families or couples became children or already had small children. It's a very homogeneous group which is interesting because, of course, we are asking for, diverse, for a diverse society. On the other hand, I think an experimental building like this one is maybe easier to realize with a group that is homogeneous. So when it was finished, very often we were asked, how, is the heterogene um, how heterogeneous is this building? And I'm always saying it's not, but it can be, because the day of layout of the building allows for all generations and the transformation of family life and so on. But 
we couldn't do it with a diverse group. But you will see that the next project is much more diverse. So, and then you have a car here. This is the staircase. This is the elevator. And here is bus room and kitchen. And here it is along this wall. So it's a linear car. Mm. The souterrain again. And you see how the building is placed. So it has no, the site has no, flan, uh, no fence. It's 2,000 square meters big. It's like a huge garden. And the garden enlarges itself into the, this landscape. Uh, but here, this is a building from the 1990s when the new plan for Berlin was to remember the block and to respect the streets. So what we try to do is to somehow negotiate between the two concepts within one simple building. This is the communal space. It was delivered in a raw, in a more raw condition and this is an artwork, and they have a little guest room here behind the curtain, and a kitchen. And I really like this photograph because it shows that the material is really simple. This is raw concrete, not in the best um, not in the mo most expensive and best way, but in a quite simple way. This is concrete. It's what it is. And then you have bricks here. And this is uh, the door. It's made from steel. So we took the, the most simple material and products that we found. But look at this. This is designed. This is drawn. Somebody has drawn this. And you usually don't find this because most houses that we know, new houses, have products as railings, products as panels, products as this and this and this. So here in a way, you can find, yeah, here you can see this has been drawn, designed. Mm. If you look at the apartments, they're also quite raw. They have kind of concrete flooring with the heating. I don't know what it is in English, but it's a heating system that is embedded into the flooring. But usually you would put wood or linoleum or something on it. This is the under construction. I think that the English word is screed, but I don't know. It's a, so it's liquid almost liquid and you put it on isolation and in German it's schwimmende Estrich. You, it, you cannot connect it to the wall, it has to be separate. Um, you can see that the wooden facade is also the idea of the interior space, so how the house looks from the outside, it also looks from the inside. And I, show you, I will show you a few images. We tried to work with prefabricated materials. So you can see that the ceiling has these um, slits. <laughs> this is because it's semi-prefabricated. This is a triangular space, the bookshelf. Ah, and what you can see here is that the interior walls, uh, we decided together with the residents that part of the interior walls are prefabricated. So the yellow wall comes from um, a school context. So how, if you build schools, you would use uh, prefabricated walls for the toilets. And this is what we used here. And they were able to choose between red, yellow, blue, and so on. 
And this is how, this is, um, this is how the balcony and this rotation comes together. And then the next image shows the balcony. So it's not the balcony where you, you would have a table and six seats and having a heavy dinner. It's more like taking a blanket or a pillow or something out and then, or a chair maybe, and then read and then take it inside again. Which is nice, I think, because mm, it's more like that the threshold between interior and exterior space is more permeable, maybe. Mm. I wanted to include this drawing, which is a more technical drawing, but it shows that there's an architectural approach behind the wall. And you can see the skeleton to the left, and then you can see the various layers um, that show the, the wall and the balcony and the railing and so on and so on. Yeah, and this is the building. It's called R50 Co-housing. Mm. And now I want to show you some images from the afterlife. So from my position as an architect, it's the afterlife. From the position of the, from the residents, it's their life. So this again is the collective space. This is a more, a wider image where you can see the kitchen, the artwork that you saw before. And you can also see how large the space is. It's quite large, it's 60 square meters and then double height. And I included this image because there was an intern in our partner office from Saint-Étienne in France, and he provided the design for the kitchen. So it's not an architect's kitchen, it's an architect student's kitchen. And this was realized, and we are very happy about it because the whole idea of this building is not to finalize it, but in a way to make it possible that the people who live there are able to transform it and to finish it. And then uh, there are two images from the first winter when the residents started to make party, to have parties there and how people use the, the communal space. This and this one, which I like. And then there are, there are many, many publications. I've sh chosen two which are quite prominent because they are um, somehow uh, widening the field of architecture into other fields. Texte zur Kunst is an art magazine and they have done a feature about the building and an interview with four artists who live in the building and this was a publication in a magazine called Metropolis. It's published in New York. And this author, Jessica Bridger, is discussing the idea of the commune and what this building and the approach and how people live together, how, how this would be related to the idea of the commune. Is it a commune or not? And what is a contemporary idea of living together? And in 2015, this was two years um, after we completed the building, we were invited to an exhibition in Prague in a gallery called uh, Galerie Qualita. And this was curated by Helena Dudova. She is a young curator. She was 29 at that time, I think. She's a young curator from Prague, but commuting between uh, Berlin and Prague, and she was a friend of Vladimir Fialka, who was the project architect in our office. He came from Prague. He was very young. He came right after graduation. He had to do this project with us, and then he left. So it was his, I don't know, a very strange <laughs> professional experience to do something like this. And the two of them uh, had the idea to invite six projects to Prague because they 
found that the housing market in Prague is very bad and that for young people it's almost impossible to find an apartment and everyone has to buy, there's nothing for rent and nothing for, um, nothing to participate in, very hard to be involved in how we want to live. Um, and it was a very nice exhibition. I really enjoyed it. So they invited six projects. One of them was ours. Students from the Technical University in Prague built the models. It looks a little bit different, but huge models. And they had a second room. This is the model. They had a second room where they started to do workshops during the course of the, the exhibition. So they would have like project cards and they invited friends and young people from Prague. This is an artwork by Jon Bock that they included in the exhibition. And they also did a publication, which I really liked. It was done by graphic designers who I thought were <laughs> did really good work because it was a beautiful publication and the whole pub, um, exhibition and publication was called Baugruppe ist super. And then a last afterlife, uh, the house has been used for films and this is um, Homeland, do you know the series? No. Homeland, it's the fifth part of it, and then uh, number 11, <laughs> and the fifth part is in uh, Berlin, and they use the house uh, to house the, pr the professor who, was together with two students, was about to build a bomb. And now I'm guiding you through the house a second time. I took them from my laptop, so um, you can see the ramp and the entrance, the trench coat man is standing in the communal space. And now the young terrorist is um, fleeing from his professor's apartment. Uh, he's using the balcony, of course. Police is arriving. And Nina Hoss, she's a very famous German actress against the concrete seal. No. And now I'm taking you on a walk back to the flower market because this is what we want to see. Uh, this is a building from the 1980s Internationale Bauausstellung. And it's a, it's a walk I did in, I think, 2011 together with Andrew, the photographer. And we were inter really interested to revisit these buildings that are, mm, in a way, small scale. They are urban, but they are small scale. They are the way how the Internationale Bauausstellung in the 1980s imagined the reinvention of the city after the large house, social housing blocks from the 1970s. And it's very interesting how the details of these buildings are made. So look at this. And the last one of the series is the Hermann Herzberger Bau. This is a famous Dutch architect. I don't know if you have heard his name. Um, and he built this building also in the context of the IBA uh, 87, but together with a cooper um, cooperative. And the same cooperative is part of the clients of our building at the flower market. And this is next door. So this is just 200 meters from our site. So now back to the flower market. You, see the, you can see the flower market hall. And this is the zoning plan that has been done um, in the middle of the 2000s. 
and you can see three large building plots and a public space. The, the public square is the yellow and white stripes. And then the discussion was, can it be that these large plots will be part of a bidding where the highest bid will get the plot and then there will be another hotel or another office building. And then the city together with the district uh, of Kuppelstein <coughs> Kreuzberg, after many discussions and initiatives um, who said this is not possible, uh, a lot of artists are living here, we have social housing, this will totally gentrify the whole area, so it has to be different. So the city of Berlin, together with the district, um, they decided to have a concept-based bidding, a little bit like the one that we took part in with the Ritterstraßen project, but in a larger scale, because this time the price was not fixed and the whole process was public and it went over one year or so. So there were several stages, the public was involved, and in the end we were success successful together with IFAO that um, we were able to develop this plot here, this one. Um, after decision making about the, the bidding, it became clear that usually if a public plot is sold, they have to do an architectural competition, which is good because if the plot is sold to someone, anyone, it's good to guarantee quality by having an architectural competition. But in this, time, in this case, the bidding was different, so the competition was, it was not really clear why to have a competition if all three plots have been given to developing architects. So we developed together with the district and the Senate a new format that was used instead of the competition, it was a more collective approach to guarantee the quality of the detailing, the quality of the public space, the quality of the ground floor area, and so on and so on. This took one and a half years. There were experts, jury members. It was like a competition, but in a very long phase. And I think there were four large meetings, so on. Yeah. And here you can see our building. And this, is, uh, this diagram is important, I have to explain it to you. We applied for the plot with an integrated concept which integrated a variety of uses and also a structural approach to architecture. You can see that the cooperative Selbstbaugenossenschaft Berlin AG is here. They hold 25% of the client, the group, the client group. Then we have commercial, we have a social institution, we have uh, owners, individual owners who live in their, the apartments they have uh, paid for. We have creative industries and local initiatives and services. So this was the diagram that we used and we also provided plans and this is only a diagram of the building to come. And the idea of the building was to use um, the plot as good as possible to have a kind of maximum volume which wouldn't allow for a lot, op a lot of open space around, but we then decided to have open space within the building. So this is how we developed this uh, access, this circulation uh, system, which is based on two vertical cords and then streets, horizontal streets, and some of the streets are on the ground, outside of the building, 
one street, the so-called Rue Interieur, which you might know from Le Corbusier in Marseille, uh, is within the building. And then you have the so-called Rue Exterieur, which is on the roof. And this system, which looks quite simple, allows for a great variety of housing typologies and also studio space. And this is the section. There are two sections. I will show you both. Because the Rue Interieur, which is here, yeah, um, is not dark, but there are courtyards with daylight. So if you look at this image, you will see this is the section that shows one of the courtyards. There are five courtyards altogether. And if we go back, you might see and understand how it works. So here is a double height studio to the flower market hall on the ground floor. Here's a double height studio in the souterrain. You already know that we like souterrain space, to activate souterrain space. So this is the double height sunken studio space. This is the cheapest square meter in the house. Um, then we have a so-called split level here, which, yeah, which is accessed by a gallery, a Laugengang. Then we have the Rue Interieur with small apartments to the south and larger apartments here that are accessed with stairs and they have a little space here that is accessed from the Rue, de, uh, Rue Interieur which allows for a flexible way of use. So, for example, if you have two doors, children who become students can stay living with their parents, but they have their own door and they can come and go as they want and so on. We learned this from old Gründerzeit apartments in Berlin, where you have there used to be two accesses, but one was for the servants, one was for the um, bourgeois family, but then later on the, the apartments which are much too large have been transformed for Wohngemeinschaften or they have been split into two apartments. So our own housing biography <laughs> in Berlin um, tells us these stories. So this is one and then the same type is here again but accessed from the roof so it is mirrored, if you want. Yeah. And this is the Rue Interieur um, during construction. Um, and another image that shows one of the courtyards also during construction. Um, and then I can go through some um, Type housing or studio and apartment typology, which is not so important at the moment, but I will, you can, it's, it works like this, that yellow is where we are in the section, and then you have an idea of this axonometric drawing that uh, shows you how it works, more or less. Um, this is, for example, the uh, the large apartment that has two floors and two doors. And the studio on the ground floor. And then there's a series of connections because um, as soon as we had identified how these different typologies work, and there was this group we were able to work with them to identify their needs and then it was possible to combine typologies that work on their own but can also be combined and then there's some changes and so on and so on. So in a way there are parts of the previous project that came into this project. We had a very um, intensive uh, collaboration with the users on one hand but on the other hand there's a very clear structural approach to the building itself because otherwise it wouldn't work. 
Yeah, and there's a new series of images. Uh, during this long process, we found it quite difficult to explain the users and future residents and studio users about certain architectural decisions that we wanted to, made, to make. And um, we always find that it's necessary for us as architects to develop tools how to present our work in different stages because we are always communicating with someone and we have to know how to communicate our ideas and also to, to be a little bit ahead in order to be able to argue for the project or to offer a series of variations. And in, I think it was in 2016, 17, we had an intern from Copenhagen who, by the way, came from Sandra Bartoli because he worked with Bureaus for Constructivismus before and then he came into our office and he was a fantastic he, he, drawer. He, he really knew how to draw. This was what he was really focused on. And we thought what he could do because we found out that it could be really interesting to do a project together that was based on drawing. So at that time, we had all these sessions with the clients. There were 60 something all together. And then for five months, he was drawing the, uh, the project. Construction had just started, but he was commissioned <laughs> in a way to draw all the details and thresholds that were important for us as architects. You might remember the railing in the staircase of the R50 co-housing project and imagine this large building, how many railings, how many details, how many windows, how many thresholds, how many, um, yeah, maybe threshold is the best word because it's always between private, and communal, or communal and public. And uh, this is an entrance, and this is on the other side of the building, the communal laundry. And if you enter the foyer, this is the stairs. And this is also interesting. This is the souterrain ateliers that are sunken, but they have a gallery, and the gallery is connected to the, uh, to the open space to the south. So there are little bridges that uh, lead to the gallery level of the souterrain ateliers. And there's a space between uh, to bring light to the souterrain. You will see later. Yeah. This is the gallery that has glass bricks to also to bring light down to the souterrain level. And then the Rue Interieur was, of course, very important how to communicate the qualities of this space that is a little bit wider than it should be, that has these courtyards. And how would these courtyards be? I mean, how would they, what would they offer? And you can see that we provided benches here, concrete benches. These are the stairs to the large apartments on the next level. And we imagined plants growing <laughs> like this. And this is the rooftop. This is the street on the rooftop. And to the right, you can see the studios. And to the left, you can see the glass roof of one of the courtyards. And a garden. And now I'm going to present the different levels with photographs, now that you know the building quite well. So this is the rooftop, the upper rooftop level. And then there is 
another level with the rooftop street where there is a communal space, a little bit like the one in the other project, but this is much more simple. It is only a space. It has no kitchen. It has a kitchen, but it's very simple. And you can see a few stairs outside that lead to the garden. We needed construction heights to have a garden there. <clears throat> and you can also see, which is quite interesting, the other side of the plot, because all images and drawings I showed you were looking from the south to the north. <clears throat> and here you can see how it looks like to the south. So this is social housing blocks from the 1970s. And um, Mm, this was summer 2018, no plans yet, but a kind of first party. To the right, the Liebeskind building here. And this is a beautiful, very small painting that is um, mm, presented in the Städel Museum. It belongs to the collection of the Städel Museum in Frankfurt. And it's called Das Paradiesgärtlein, so the little paradise garden. And we love this image very much. And uh, we presented it to the clients because they were asking why this garden on the rooftop has walls. So what would it mean? Um, this is from the 15th century, so it's quite old, painted on wood, but I saw it once, it's like this, it's very small. And this is the level with the, so the, the second roof level, um, where you can see the four studios. So the very first image was here. You can see the rooftop uh, bungalows and here parts of the apartments to the south with their balconies and here the garden. And some details, this is the same location as the very first image. And again, I wanted to show you a little bit of the detailing of the building. So it's a really small scale. Um, <clears throat> you can see how the railings are made. They are made from prefabricated material on, material on one hand, but they are designed on the other hand, so it's a mixture between um, both, maybe. And this building you've already seen. I might present you this building. It's a very beautiful building from 1987. It's also related to the IBA, the Internationale Bauausstellung. It has been built by John Heidduck, the American architect, one of the very few buildings he has done. So this is one of the rooftop studios. They are, they are quite high, so there can be a gallery. In this case, the artist who is Using this space has, I think he has done it in a very nice way. So he has put, I don't know what it is in English, Leinwand, where you, the framework and the textile where you would do oil painting on. So he has constructed this kind of panels here. His, um, he would say that he didn't like the strong difference between white and concrete. So he wanted something that would um, make, good, make good acoustics, but at the same time would um, yeah, relate the concrete to the wall. Mm. This is still the studio. <clears throat> you can sleep on the, here, on the, bathroom, you can sleep here, you can see it here. And he's working with another artist who is an architect trained at ETH in Zurich, and they are at the moment working with a 3D um, 
scans. And the first thing they did was scanning the studio. So it's interesting that the building, in a way, leads to production or inhibits uh, our production. Um, this is one of the floor plans with the large apartments. You can see they are very long, like 23 meters. But as there are daylight here, and the kitchen is usually here, it's very beautiful because you have flexible space here, flexible space here. You can have one or two rooms because the windows, again, are made in a modular way so that you can shift two different sizes of windows. Not shift every day, but during the design process, we decided with every party if we should use the window like this. Yeah, and um, it's a little bit more structured than the other project, but it has some similarities, I think. So you see the difference, but you can also see the, the approach. Um, again, and this is how, so here you can see the length of the apartment and how the daylight comes into the apartment in the middle. And this is another case. Mm. And this is the level with the Rue Interieur. Uh, and this is how it looked maybe a year ago. No plants yet. And uh, here we are looking into a south apartment. Yep. This is the stair that will lead to the large apartment on the next level. And the, this apartment to the south is very beautiful. It's sunlit and very, it's not very large, but it has a very generous uh, layout, I think. And in in this case, it has a kind of footprint on the level to the gallery. So again, two typologies have been merged or combined or related to each other. This is where she sleeps. And again, the Rue Interieur. And then this is the, the first experiments with plants. Um, and this is the other side, so this is the space to the north that, is, uh, that can be used independently but is connected to the large apartment. So we didn't want to offer apartments that are north only. That's why the northern part is connected and the southern um, units are independent. And there's another detail I would like to tell you on the north side, we have provided the windows so that they would reach the ceiling so that the northern light comes into the apartment and the ceiling works as a kind of reflector. And you have 40 centimeters, so it doesn't go to the ground. But on the other side, it's the other way around. You have 40 centimeters beyond the ceiling it starts and then you can open it to the balcony. Yeah, this is the gallery level. Mm. And this is a, quite an interesting unit because it's two artists who have two studios and they also live there. So they have combined um, a unit to the gallery and a double height studio unit to the north, to the uh, flower market hall. And I will guide you through their environment. So this is where she works. This is where they sleep in the center. This is where they cook. And then there's a glass wall because he works with oil paint and it stings and he likes to hear music. So they needed a separation wall. 
Um, yeah. This is where he works. And this is how the studio space that is quite raw. In this case, we have provided quite raw space and a kind of um, kit how to further furnish um, the spaces. And then with every artist, we have decided if the stairs like this or like this, but the detailing and the material is always the same. And one of the units to the north, one of the units that is oriented to the public square is used by an artist who does ceramics, but she's also an opera singer and she's Korean and she also has a Korean cafe in the same space. So on the gallery she has her pottery and um, it's a very good restaurant, so if you ever visit, <laughs> don't miss to have lunch or coffee here. Yeah, this is the next level. And there are also ateliers to the south, but only three. And this is an artist who works with textile. A very um, interesting artist, I think. Um, yeah. And the souterrain. This is one of the Souterrain studios, you can see how much daylight there is, even though we are in the basement. Mm. And this is li the little courtyard uh, that brings the daylight and also allows for having a little outdoor space to the Souterrain studios and the bridge that leads to the gallery. Now there's some drawings. Um, this is the northern facade. Uh, you can see the four rooftop studios and the three levels that have housing, apartments, and the double height artist studios here, including the Korean cafe. And it was very important for us to discuss how the relationship to the public space, to the public square would be. And our idea was that not commercial space, but production would activate the public space so that something is going on there, but not to attract the public, but because something is produced. And yeah, this is the southern side with the balconies. And now I will tour you around the area because you haven't seen <laughs> anything. So this is the new Tats building. It's another publishing house. Um, it's an, it started as an alternative publishing house and now they have, um, after many years of publishing, they have their own building. And this is also part of the larger environment of the Blumengroßmarkt. And here, this is another building that came out of the concept-based bidding. It's called Fritz 23. And it's also very interesting. It's a Baugruppe for, um, I would say, workspace. For example, the magazine Arch Plus that you might know has their um, spaces there, but also competition line and uh, some other creative offices. And um, one part of the building is a kind of apartment hotel that the architects developed and planned and also maintain. So it's a mix of different, I would say, maybe creative, workspace, more or less. Um, this is our building, again, from the south and from the west. This is where the laundry is and also a workshop and also a two-story 
bicycle parking space. So there is a ground floor access and then a ramp to bring the bicycles to the basement. And the reason is that in Berlin you don't have to provide parking if you build. This was the case until I don't know when and then they stopped it. So in most German cities you have to build parking when you build a house, but here you don't have to build a house and uh, a parking and the residents decided to have no cars. So that's why the bicycle parking space is so important to make it comfortable. Mm, this reminds a little bit of the beautiful drawings of Aske, the Danish student, because it shows some of the details. The facade, it's a um, ceramic facade that we designed. So we designed the product as well. And it's very interesting how the different light, like sunlight or other, um, how it reflects, how the, how the building reflects daytime and nighttime and different um, light situations. Yeah, and this is another detail I would like to present to you the way how the studio space on the ground floor to the north to the flower market hall is uh, made. So there is a door, but there's also a kind of clapper so that you can bring fresh air without open the door. I don't know if you've ever been at my school at Bauhaus Universität Weimar. We have the main building is by Henry van der Felde. This is also where the Bauhaus has been founded, but the building was there before. It was an art school. And we have um, these ateliers with wooden doors that have these second openings, and we like them very much. And this is an event in uh, summer 2018, the magazine Arch Plus approached us to have um, an Arch Plus feature in the building. It was during um, the process of moving in, so it was a little bit difficult. But um, we then developed a format where we would have three panels at different parts of the building. And one of the panel was in the Rue Interieur, so little discussions. And another panel was on the rooftop, and a third panel was in the studio of one of the artists. And I'm showing this because you can see an artwork that she produced during the planning process, and you can see that the idea of the Hortus Conclusus, the, the garden that is framed or protected, has somehow found its way into her work, which of course we like very much. And this is, I think it's my last image. This is the Rue Interieur during the panel. And what is nice about this picture is that for a moment it's a public space because of this event. And it also shows a little bit the scale. So it shows that the bench can be used for seating, the concrete bench. And that the daylight serves for looking at each other and presenting something. And there was also a bar, and it was a very happy day for all of us. Thank you. Are you yes, I said. <laughs> Thank no. you very much. I, I, it was really nice that you uh, presented just that part of, especially that part of your work which is connected with housing mm -hmm. and with IBA and Berlin because actually I started the series introducing the German city mm. exactly with, with the idea of IBA because this is something uh, the Slovak architects have always been looking mm -hmm. at in the history. So mm -hmm. it was a nice... 
somehow how we connect yeah. it uh, yeah, yeah. on internet. So it's, uh, I would like to have. A tr I know that you all would like to ask many questions, but I will ask the first one <laughs> if you don't mind. Uh, it is interesting how you how you work with um, some kind of of phenomenon that have been invented or or proposed by a modern movement architects mm -hmm. and uh, my question would be is it like that you take some kind of these ideas to um, redesign them or, or um, develop them uh, for contemporary times with the intention to create a new phenomenon to be repeated or is it only like ah, interesting. use it for, for yeah. Side specific okay. Solutions. Yeah. Because okay. That's this is something. Yeah. 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 It's it's a very interesting question. So the first project um, has been discussed a lot as a generic project. So as soon as it was finished, many people approached us. Can we put it here? Can we put it here? Can we put it here? Of course, there's a kind of idea that you could, could transform and put it somewhere else. But then if you look closely, for example, look at the all around balconies. It works if the people who live there have decided to have them. There's no barrier between one balcony and the other one because there's only one. So the idea was, can we use this for rent? For you know, the city of Berlin provides a kind of. We don't have social housing in the way it was in the 1970s or 60s and 70s, but we have housing associations, six city-owned housing associations. They maintain the huge amount of houses that there are, um, and they also started to build new housings and they have to provide 50% of the apartments they are uh, building for six euro 50 per square meter. So they have a, there's a governance or a kind of political aspect about what they are doing. They can make profit, but only 5%. And 50% has to be given to people who can not pay more than six euro fifty. And as we know, I think half of the Berliners can't. Yeah. No. Um, and we had these discussions, can you have a building like this for people who didn't decide to live together but have been lucky or not to get an apartment in a building like this? And the answer is people usually don't like to use the same balcony if, if they didn't decide to be a group. Why would they? They would have their barriers and so on and so on. So this building might not work for other conditions than that people have followed the whole process and at, on one evening have said, yes, we can imagine to share a balcony, a large, all around balcony, yeah? Because security is not what we are interested in. We trust each other, we want to visit each other. The children want to visit. This balcony is like a street. I mean, the interior street, Rue Interieur of one building mm. replaces the all around balcony of the other building. So the circulation, we, ha we are thinking about circulation as hopefully being more than just coming, going from A to B. And this is of course quite radical because usually people want to go from A to B and then close the door behind and then be in their private space. So there's a quite radical approach against what we have learned and become that we want to know what is ours and are not interested in what others do and think and how they spend their time and so on. And this is the interesting thing about Baugruppen because if you work with people who have decided to live together, it changes a lot and we are very happy it's hard work. 
I don't know if you have listened to six years of planning or <laughs> I don't know, something or 60 meetings, evening meetings, I mean evenings that you could also spend with your family and friends and so on. But um, it's rewarding in a way that I think we managed to do things that we would never have been able to do with a client who wants to sell. It's a large difference. Because it's a difference if you, want, if you work with people who want to live, and not only to live, but to live together, to share, and who are happy about what they get. Of course, it wasn't that easy because they were saying that it's going to be too expensive, they don't need the facade. In the end, they said, we can have a very simple facade. We have the building, we don't need the facade. We were really, <laughs> we really said, we were really hoping that we could manage. In the end, it worked out, yeah. So the modernist elements, that's very interesting. We have discussed it between us so many times. We think that there are so many interesting elements in modernist buildings which at that time, or maybe later, haven't been appreciated in the way it could be. Look at, for example, Robin Hood Gardens by the Smithsons. It has been destructed because people don't like it. They don't want to have a street in the sky, or the developers say people don't like a street in the sky, or they say, yeah, um, there's so many poor people living there, they're not respecting privacy and so on. And the interesting thing is that working with these people changes the appro uh, approach to modernist mm -hmm. architecture. And it's your, we're in a way able, or have been able, because we're now doing other things. It's not that we only <laughs> want to do this, but we are aware that we have been able to reflect modern architecture in a very privileged way with people who appreciate what it is and can be and and then of course people are much more aware now that we cannot and don't want to you know we live on so many square meters per person and we know that we have to be happy with less in the future because it cannot be like this I mean and rents and prices for housing are so much rising and um, the most important discussion now is the ground, who owns the ground. In this case, the ground, the public, um, the ground was owned by the city and it was sold to this community. But I think it, if it was today, the ground would not be sold because the communities are starting to not selling their land because we all know that selling the land means that the land is part of the <coughs> financial system, yeah? And this is a, a key argument about how to develop housing for the future, besides climate and so on, but yeah. And yeah, so I don't know if I answered your question. And what is funny about this building, this of course you cannot take and build it somewhere else. It has so many components, you know, the density, Actually, the, the, the... The idea of an yeah, interior yeah. Um, <laughs> street or road is, is uh, something that you can build also yeah. in a different and situation. But I think that uh, you perfectly answered the question because uh, the concern of the modernist architects in the uh, beginning mm -hmm. of the 20th century, they just served an idea to an audience and they actually forced the inhabitants mm. to, to live there in such a manner. But you, mm. you did it just the other way around, that you, you borrowed a kind of, of um, mm. phenomenon mm -hmm. and uh, you offer it to a people, you discuss it with people, whether yeah. they like yeah, it or yeah, yeah. don't. So it's, it's a completely different approach. No, it's very and interesting. That, uh, it. yeah. <laughs> it's very interesting. We have, of course, learned a lot and when we were halfway with this project, we really wanted to do a project with one of these housing associations because we knew that this is a privileged situation, even though they are not rich, but it's privileged because they have the privilege to be able to decide to be part of a project like this. And this is not possible for everyone. There are people who need 
the apartment right now or who cannot imagine to be part of a planning process that would lead to somewhere, you know. So um, we took part in a kind of competition and won a project. I didn't include it into this lecture, but you can look it up on our website. It's called Paul Zubelstraße, and this is um, a project where we provided something like 70 apartments for people we don't know. And the question was, can we have floor plans that are also flexible? So we introduced the concept of rotation into um, floor plans that are very fixed usually because these um, apartments that are funded by the public, they have to cater for like two rooms, three rooms, four rooms, you know, it's the same here. And um, so we try to combine the rooms in a different way so that also with these apartments, even though they cater for this format, um, um, that you can live there, for example, as a Wohngemeinschaft, mm -hmm. so that it's not about, uh, you know, parents, children, living, and so on, but that it's room, 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 and you can use it like this, and this, and this, and this. And then we tried to, um, we tried to implement a communal space, because we found it really interesting and Im Im important, but it was not part of the financial framework, because the financial framework in this case was based on mm, mm, a certain budget per square meter and square meter for a, a housing, living uh, square meter and not communal space. So we provided a bicycle storage room on the ground floor to the public space between the two buildings and we designed large doors that you can open and if you take the bicycles out you have a kind of, yeah. So we, <laughs> we tried to bring some ideas and approaches to this, yeah. This is absolutely fascinating for, for our audience here, mostly architects, uh, or architects who will be, our students who will be architects <laughs> in Slovakia because uh, they will probably never have the opportunity to do such an experience. Why? Because, because we really do not have the social housing or the publicly um, oh. financed housing. It's a, a very, very small percentage of the, of the mm. general yeah. construction yeah, yeah. housing, which is nearly 80% or 90% done by developers, mm. it's like free market. Like in Prague, that was a, exactly. a huge that, discussion. But yeah, but in a in a way, it's the same in Berlin because there are so many developers who are making money with housing. So this is two examples out of. <laughs> You're lucky. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard work. <laughs> yeah. Please now, your questions, dear audience. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, and, uh, because I think that roof gardens are not just for gathering, but usually for looking at the city or something. Yeah. So. yeah, it's a very good question. I have a few answers. So one answer is, there's a rooftop area that I didn't show. This is really large, and this you have a perfect view in the city. And then the next roof level is the one with the street, where you have the studio spaces and the accesses to the apartments and so on. And this garden is exactly where our building is opposite of the Baroque building. So the height is very much, it's part of the zoning plan I showed in the beginning that we were 
it's a, the, the volume of the building includes a very strong um, mm, mm, awareness of the height because it's opposite of the building. And we thought that this street on the rooftop that's partly because there are walls to the right and to the left, that the connection between this street and the garden is much nicer if they have something to do with each other instead of leaving the street, coming to an open, windy, <laughs> cold, and then looking at the Jewish Museum from the rooftop and having a party and having the public from the public square down there see that there are people who are happy enough to have a rooftop garden. And we found in a way that we have to protect the public, <laughs> you know, that it's not only to have the nicest view. Every developer would have argued the view, but we have developed, it's the community. It's the interior qualities. And if you want to have the view, you go on the other roof level. There are no walls, but what can you do there? It's windy, you have a nice view. But this is a kind of space. So the connection between the um, communal space, the simple communal space and the garden, very strong. It looks a little bit strange on the images. And meanwhile, there are plants against the concrete walls. It looks really beautiful. And I have beautiful photographs. <laughs> I can show them to you because there was a Japanese group a few weeks ago. You would, would you like to see them? It looks a little bit oh, different. Yeah. They are newer, um, but, um, but it's not here. It's on my laptop. OK, we don't have it. It's on my laptop. Yeah. <laughs> it's very nice because they had, there's one photo. It's so nice because there are already flowers. And these Japanese students, they were yellow, pink, and light blue, and so on. It was really interesting how the whole scenario changed with the flowers on one hand and the students on the other. But I, I mean, it's just fascinating how you again somehow uh, took the phenomenon of the modernism, the roof terrace, mm. but just another way around. <laughs> you, mm. you close it as mm, a mm, medieval mm. Uh, paradise mm. garden, so it's, it's really nice paradise you know, garden. always played with this, with mm. this uh, idea. No. Yeah, we work with references, but not in the way that we use them one to one. So we like, sometimes we find references after we have done something. So it's not that we are looking for references, collect them and then design. It's the other way around. It's more like parallel realities. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Okay. More questions. Are you working with references a lot? Are you aware of what references can mean for your work? I mean, not something that you like and you take it and make it, but references in a, in a more, in a different way that you, that you are discussing certain projects because of their content and their theoretical approach. I think it's very interesting. They should. Oh, they do, maybe. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, is there, I mean, yeah. Oh, yes, please. Um, can you hear a little bit louder? I just, um, right now, um, actually, uh, this kind of topic is kind of connected also to my project and, and my studio, which I'm dealing with right now, mm -hmm. which is, um, I chose a site in Berlin, one of my favorite. In Berlin? Mm -hmm. Yes, and um, I have to admit that many times when I'm discussing uh, my studio, what I did there or what I'm working with is this somehow shared balcony, which is also um, an entrance to the building. So actually, every everyone has to go around my my apartment, mm -hmm. around my windows, and go inside the go inside the, the apartment. And many times I'm meeting with the opinions like. Oh, I wouldn't like to live in an apartment where someone is walking by my window yeah. and someone is. But I want to feel free in my apartment and I want to do whatever I want without the being scared that someone is looking at me and judging me or some 
I'm, I'm meeting very often with this opinion, and, and um, I would love to that, of course, I'm making the studio into my imagination, into my picture. Mm -hmm. Like I, I don't, I wouldn't mind, for example, to having this shared space. But I, I feel maybe between us, between people, like what is? I don't know. I, I don't really know um, um, the, the feeling of the of the apartment and this this. Uh, being afraid of someone looking into my mm -hmm. window or something. What is your... Yeah, um, it's a very interesting question. So when we go back to our 50 co-housing, because of the 23 meters of length, there's no problem at all because they are not sitting next to each other and they would never... I mean, the house teaches them how to use it and if you have 23 meters of balcony why would you go to the balcony of another person no. yeah the opposite is true you can visit your neighbor if you want to and if he wants to or she wants to but uh, the question has for me another there's another question behind um, of course we are also thinking a lot about laubengang access that's what you are doing in your studio and the problem is that um, the, the concept of the Laubengang has in Germany still a bad, I don't know, reputation. it's not reputation, I tell you why, I, I have so analyzed it. Yeah, I have analyzed it. I think the, La the Laubengang we know from the social housing from the 1960s and 70s is mostly in this way that the Laubengang is in the north and that you have a little window to the toilet, maybe another one to the kitchen and the nice living room is to the south with the balcony. That's, you find it very, very often. And the idea was you can have a cheap building like apartment, 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 Laugengang, that's it. If you analyze it a bit, you will find out that it is like a suburban house that is minimized. So people behave as if they have a house and they have a garden and so on. But the Laubengang has the potential to be a collective space, but it has not been used as this. Maybe the Smithsons had this idea with the street in the sky, but the Laubengang, if you find in so many houses, it's very often the opposite. Who wants to speak to someone else in the north, yeah, where <laughs> there are only little windows to the toilets? I mean, it doesn't smell nice, there's no sunlight, there are no plants because there are no, there's no sunlight. So one thing is, if you want to use a Laubengang, try to put it in the west or the east, because then you have more, the, the, the apartments will be to the west and to the east. And then you can have, for example, a room to the Laubengang for someone who works at home, and everything is different. Someone who, let's say, is a psychologist, or a graphic designer who works at home in a room that is used for working at home and this person is very happy to be connected to a kind of communal area. That's one thing. The, the house that we are building in Fürth has a Laubengang to the east and then, because it's a long building, it shifts to the west, so the building shifts like this. And we also provide either a large, beautiful window to the other side, or a little balcony, because we think you cannot ask people to use a Laubengang as a private balcony, because people have the idea of having a private open space but you can encourage them to use the Laubengang. And we make it a little bit wider than it has to be. And what is quite important is that how the windows are made. I mean, you cannot have glass windows to the ground, one, me one meter 40 or something Laubengang, and there's no privacy at all. So you have to think about 
the threshold between one and the other. And of course, the use and the orientation and so on. I think it's a very interesting topic. Keep your idea of, of, of course. open gallery. Yeah, of course. But be, but, be caref <laughs> but be careful and not naive, because if you're naive, it will, you know, you have to be very careful and very uh, sensitive for exactly what you said. How would people so have their privacy and also being part of a communal life? Yeah. Some more practical questions, perhaps, <laughs> regarding your work for studio. <laughs> Other questions are allowed to see. Uh, last time you promised me you will ask. <laughs> so no, if, yeah. If, if there is a problem with English, then you can put it in a slot and, and we will. Yeah, to there is a question. Yes, hmm? Thank you for your presentation. And my question is that you, this building was designed for specific people and for people. Decided to live together, but when the generation will change, mm -hmm. so there will be different people. No. So will it work? It's also a very good question. Yeah. We discussed it a lot with the first building that I presented because there the community is very well knit, and as I told you, it's quite homogeneous. So they're the same age, so they are getting older together. The children are you know, getting older together. And they were aware of this problem from the beginning. And as far as I know, they have written a manifesto, what to do if someone wants to sell the apartment. The only thing is that the right of ownership is not only in our countries, also in Japan and so on. The right of ownership is almost the highest principles. So you cannot, in this kind of group system, because they, everyone owns an apartment. In the end, the, the, the system of the Bau group is that they finance it together, but then after permission, it is split into single individual ownership. So in the end, it's the same as if they would have bought it from the market. The only thing is that it has been 25% cheaper because there was not, no developer to take money out, one thing. And the other thing, they have been part of the design process, they have participated, they identify more with the building and so on and with their co-inhabitants. But then in the end, they can sell and they can make money with it. For example, the day when the R50 co-housing was finished, the value of the apartments was double than what they had paid, of course, because it's good architecture, the location had changed, um, the building has transformed the environment. <laughs> um, we have created a really affordable building by decision making and design. So, of course, the market says this is a great building, and so. And at the Bloom Großmark, the same. They have paid, at R50 co-housing, they have paid 2,300 euro per square meter, which is, even today, it's so, sh so cheap, including the um, communal space. And here was this building, I think it was 3,500, so it was also the, price for the land was more expensive and so on, but still it has doubled. So it's six, seven thousand now instead of three thousand five hundred. So this is also a little bit a problem for us because we have done our best to keep it low and of course the honorarium for the architect is related to the budget. So we have in a way worked against our own interests if you want. And then in the end, the, the owners have 
yeah, I, I don't know. So that's, I think, also why we want to provide our knowledge for public ho housing, because we think it's, it's not exactly what we want to do our whole professional lives, but it's interesting because there are so many aspects about contemporary architecture that you can discuss, the relation between client and architect, the role of the architect today, the role of the land, the role of housing, the change of society, work and live instead of the core family and reproduction of the same, you know, core, I don't know. And there's so many things I could go on and go on, and go on, and go on. So many things are, can be reflected within these um, projects, I think. Hmm? Yeah, well, and the situation, I mean, it's completely different if it is a, a kind of social housing that is not owned by mm -hmm. people. And if it is owned, as in the case of this community, then yeah. it's really like up to the people how they decide. Perhaps they will start to build fences. This. No, they won't. No, 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 no. They won't. And you in this know. in this building, because there's so many Somebody people. Will buy dangerous no, no, no. <laughs> in this building, so in the other building, everything is very peaceful. They are. It's a really great people. But it will be interesting when the children move out and maybe the parents move out and what will happen if people move out. But I think nobody moved out until now. So the question. No, no. Here it's a little bit different because the building is huge, the group is diverse in every dimension. So there are old ladies who share the same part of the street. <laughs> there are people who live around the courtyard and they arrange themselves with the shutters that we provided so that if you make coffee in your pyjama in the morning that you can protect yourself a little bit. Everything has been discussed in the many meetings, so <laughs> everything has been discussed. And then there are people who live together on the rooftop, so there are many um, smaller communities embedded into this large community, which is, which is really nice, I think. This is also a difference to um, modernist housing machines because they don't most of them don't really um, don't allow for smaller communities. Here, many smaller communities. The people who live around the courtyard, the people who live on the rooftop, the people who live along the Rue Interior, the people who live along the galleries, the people who have their studios. This would be a nice sociological <laughs> study. What kind of people prefer this interior? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's very interesting. For example, there's a family with three children. They have one of the large, um, uh, the large apartments, and they are very generous. So whenever we do a tour, and this is quite often, I hope it will be less, but she would, she's very friendly, and she allows um, groups of students and so on to look into every room very, very nice. And she says it feels like a house, as if there's a house for us, but we are connected to other people. Very nice. But there are also other people, so there are couples, families. There are also divorced couples who both live in the house so that the children can move from one house to the other one. Everything, yeah. All kinds of generations and it's like a city in a way. No. Oh, yes, please. Go ahead. Um, in, in the video, you were talking about uh, some references or some um, inspirations from learning architecture. Uh, my question is would you uh, recommend some kind of book or other inspirational source? Uh, Sources? For what? Study or what to do? Is a way to to get to ah, interesting. Uh, yeah. To some like yeah, principle. Mm. Is there any book that you recommend to us? The one book. The one book or three or I would like to have it. <laughs> I would 
I would like to have it. You know what, I think... Um, I was just thinking about my teaching and research because Mm, with my students, I'm really trying to experience these conditions instead of giving them one book, read it, and then do something. But we're doing a lot of excursions, and we try to, or I'm trying to relate um, kind of personal experience to the representation of architecture to, to to be able to relate things to each other. I think it's, for me, it's more relevant to learn how to relate um, individual, your individual biography and your experience to all sorts of representation in order to find out which way you want to go instead of reading a book first, then closing it, and then doing a design project. I think it's not always everything at the same time, but for example, I'm, for the second time, I'm doing a teaching research project in Weimar. The first one led us to Japan, <laughs> which was a little bit adventurous and also expensive and also very, was a, in all kinds of ways to look at it. It was a very experimental and also very successful project because we did a seminar in the beginning, six months before the trip, and we asked the students we want to stay with them for one year because what we want to do is not possible to do in one semester. That was the first thing. Then we told them we don't know if we find the money to finance you, so if you're interested, you have to use your vacation to work because we cannot do this. We cannot provide everything. So we, everyone has to do something for it. And then we went to Japan and we looked especially at this question of privacy in public space. And that was really interesting because if you um, Im emerge yourself in a different culture, you have different sensitivities to look at things because it's different and then you have to think about these things. So we visited a lot of young architects who are doing, some of them are doing very small spaces, but the question between private and public is everywhere. So every project has this into it. And then when we came back, we discussed what to do because the idea of the project was that the design project was not fixed and that we didn't have a goal, no goal at all, just experience. And then we decided to do the design project in Berlin, but not in the city center, but in the periphery because the experience we had in Japan wouldn't allow to do a contextual architecture project. So we worked on housing projects at and at the periphery of Berlin where landscape and city and a station and a hospital and a science campus and different things came together. It was really interesting. And then we had the chance to, do an, to have an exhibition, still with the students. We exhibited um, artifacts from the projects in a gallery in Berlin. And then we found that there was something from the excursion that we wanted to do research on. It was a smaller group, just three students, my assistant and myself. And we asked for funding. In the end, we got funding and the, we went back to Japan and we um, invited an artist to come with us. And we did a film about two houses that we were interested in. Old ho older houses, modernist houses, but from the 30s and 40s. And then we finished the film, and then we presented the film in Weimar twice, and then in Berlin, and then we had another funding. We went back to Tokyo in October to present the film in the Goethe Institute and to have an exhibition with film stills in one of the two houses. 
now I'm trying to bring the framed film stills back to Weimar. So it's quite a long project, like three years or so. But it's interesting because our roles have shifted. In the beginning it was you know, a teaching project with an idea of research, and now it's a research project, and my former students who are working in Switzerland are still involved because they want to be part of the project. So it's really interesting what it has done to us and has done with us. They might think about a PhD or so. We don't know yet. It's not finished yet. <laughs> so uh, maybe this is an example of how I see I, that's a little bit how maybe I work or I'm structured myself to look at things and to reflect them and to read a book and then in a way things come together. But here, for example, there were a lot of hard facts. It's not that everything is, you know, creative architecture. It's, of course, in the end, it's a very, you know, progressive project, but it was a long way. And for example, the first phase was the, um, the competition, which was not a competition. It was also, it took a long time to go through all this and to sharpen it and yeah. No, the one book, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, the answer could be that any book the yeah, maybe. Book. Yeah. It's just, uh, it depends on the process where, yeah. it is, where it will be placed or how yeah. it will be placed in your way of thinking. So it could be Bible, it could be a kind of, I don't know, uh, knowledge first typology or, or whatever. Mm. So it's up to you to. What are you reading at the moment? Yeah, biographies. You can learn a lot. Yeah, and can you relate? Can you relate this reading to your design project, or is it another part of your life? I mean. So whenever you, yeah, if you have a question that comes up next week <laughs> <laughs> or next year, you can also write me <laughs> and ask. Don't say this because then you will receive. No, no, no. I don't think like, so. Oh, Do you I think have so? This problem at my studio. 
you know, the room is like this. Can you give me some advice how to solve this? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I hope this, this will not happen. But I, I would have still one question. Yes, please. I, perhaps I, I missed the, the beginning of, of, the, of your explanation, but uh, you said something like that uh, the first um, uh, drawing or the first design uh, of a housing project was somehow related to your personal. Um, what? <laughs> but the first housing project you did in your studio. The first housing project. Yeah, that it was somehow related with your personal. I don't know. Uh, ah, okay. No, it's, it was not the. Yeah, no, no. It, your no. Or something it like was that. not the uh, the first housing project I <laughs> did, but I said that in 2008 we were somehow refounding or reinventing our office, and then there were friends from New York who wanted to buy an apartment in Berlin. We were really okay, looking so. for a commission, and. Um, she was not really able to find what she was looking for, and then I was so desperate, and I said, why don't we build the house? <laughs> so that, that's how we started to do it, and okay. we found a plot, and we built a split-level building where I live, that's, okay, so but I didn't say it. I say it now, so where I live, yeah, yeah. I, I, I just felt that it was something like this. Yeah, okay, okay, and uh, during the process, the planning process, um, we started the second project. And I, I skipped the first one, and I presented the second one. So in the beginning, we always presented the first one and the second one, and <coughs> maybe some plans of the third one. But now, the third one has become so, you know, it's so interesting to, to talk about it that I didn't want you know, to say, and then we did this, and then we did this, and then we did I this. I understand, but actually then you let them say kind of experiment as well. Okay. Yeah. It, it it's, a, it's interesting. So it's a split-level building, which we, because we had no experience how to do a project like this, and we designed a split-level building that would allow for different apartments that are not fixed at the beginning. So the whole building is like a staircase in a way. And then the apartments are taken out of this concept. So it has to, a lot to do with the two other projects, also because we, with this project, they're sliding doors as windows, large wooden, but painted wooden um, frames. But there's, there was um, a smaller one and a larger one, and with this project we could decide whether the smaller is right and the larger left, so um, the people had also some, brought in some ideas how to do it, but we had the whole responsibility, which was a little bit difficult for us because we had no experience and we wanted to make everything simple for the inhabitants, but in the end they re reacted a little bit as if they had bought something and we are responsible to deliver a perfect product. And the opposite was the case. We had, you know, started the project, so we learned that with this kind of project it's quite good if the participants come in at an early stage because um, otherwise they might behave as if they have bought something and then you are the developer and you are not getting the money for developing it because we, you are only getting the money the for, for yeah. just the responsibility. And this was a little bit the case in the first project, a little bit, not a huge problem, but a little bit. So we learned from this and um, the second project is very nice to present the idea of the Baugruppe, also because of the exhibition in Prague and all these, you know. Okay, thank you. Yeah. If there are no other questions, uh, I would thank you once again for your wonderful presentation. It was really great to have you yeah. here. Thank you for coming.